Welcome to Mr Thorpe's GCSE revision for the unit B604 Equality. This follows the OCR specification for philosophy and ethics and is one of four units that is studied during the course. Now, the principle of equality basically means the state of being equal, especially in status, rights or opportunities. Prejudice. It basically comes from the mind believing that some people are inferior or superior without even knowing them. This is something that's going to stop the principle from equality taking place. Secondly, discrimination is where you actually physically act. It's where you treat people unfairly because of, for example, their race, colour, gender, class or age or any other things as well. The principle of equality does not mean everyone is the same. However, it does mean that everyone has access to medical treatment, it does mean everyone has access to jobs, it does mean everyone has access to vote, and it does mean everyone has access to education and freedom. Now these are just five examples, but if you're talking about what equality really means, it means that people have all people have access to these different areas plus other areas of well as well that I'm sure you could think of. The history of equality in the world is not particularly good. Around the world inequality has existed and still exists. People have been treated unfairly because of a perceived difference that leads some people to believe that they are superior and others are inferior. There are a number of key areas where inequality has happened and that's racism, homophobia, disability, sexism, ageism and poverty. So let's have a look at how actually inequality has happened in these key areas. So racism, uh, if you look back in history you see slavery, black people weren't allowed to vote, they were given access to very very poor jobs, poor housing and suffered f physical and verbal abuse and in many cases death as well simply because of the colour of their skin. Homophobia, um, it was against the law in the UK, uh, only uh, in the over the last 50 years has the law been changed that it wasn't punishable by prison and again people suffered physical verbal abuse it was seen as unnatural and um, in some cases you could even be locked up in an asylum if you exhibited these uh, particular traits sexism women in the past were just seen as homemakers uh, they had no votes, no right to vote, they were seen as emotionally or intellectually weak. Uh, they can't get the jobs or they couldn't get jobs or if men were around they were given the jobs and they often got and still get lower pay. Disability. If you're disabled today, not so much in the UK but I'm sure in some areas it's still true but certainly when you look around the world, uh, if you're disabled, your access to education is going to be less, you're going to have less jobs, you're going to be on poor pay, you're going to be considered an inferior and you're going to no, have no access or little access to certain buildings or places where other people can get to simply because of your disability. Ageism, as you get older you tend to be ignored, you can't get jobs, you're seen as too old, you're inferior, possibly your access to medical treatment might be less because you're physically weaker. Um, and you might even suffer poor housing because you can't fight the case to get proper housing and you might just give up on that. Again, one really big one as well with areas of inequality is poverty. Millions of people around the world are dying of hunger and disease although there's enough food to go around the world. They're also going to have no education or poor education, medical treatment or jobs and uh, ultimately die as a consequence of this level of inequality. Well, let's have a review of some of the things we've just looked at. So, there's some questions. Can you do these questions that I'm just about to show you? Define equality. Explain at least three types of inequality. Give an example or give examples of what equality is. Explain the difference between prejudice and discrimination. Explain how prejudice and discrimination leads to it. What you can do with those questions is then uh, think about or try and answer them. Attitude towards gender, discriminating against someone because of the basis of their s of sex, 
if you look at the picture here you'll see that obviously there was a time in the UK where women were vote or protesting because they had no votes uh, it was only in 1918 this act women over the age of 31 got the right to vote and in 1928 it was lowered to 21 and today obviously all people over the age of 18 male and female can vote lower pay uh, there was an act in 1970 that ensured women and men were paid the same money for doing the same jobs. Unfortunately, although this is law, often it is still not the case where it actually is in reality. Uh, certainly with women and jobs, if you think of the Second World War, women were often doing jobs that men uh, used to do, but when the men came back, they had to go back into the homes while the men took went back to the factories, and very often women uh, struggled with this. The Sex Discrimination Act in 1975 made it illegal to discriminate against any person because of their gender, certainly in the area of work. Uh, in the past, women were expected to be at home to cook, clean, bring up children and look after her husband. And this was considered to be the traditional family. Some believe that women weren't clever enough to get involved with politics or get a job. They were certainly not seen as equal to men. Within Christianity as well it could be argued that certain Christian teachings uh, have encouraged the idea that women are the weaker sex and this has come from the idea of in the Garden of Eden Eve was deceived by the snake and then gave some to Adam and it's led someone some people to believe that women are less competent than men and in the book of Genesis it also talks about God creating Eve as a helper for Adam and again depending on how you see this you could imply this that men are in charge and women simply need to do as they're told different but equal men and women are clearly different they're physiologically different but in many ways they're equal intellectually emotionally and spiritually so there are differences we must acknowledge those but we must also acknowledge that there needs to be equal treatment of uh, the sexes in those key areas what about Jesus and women? There's a story in the Bible that talks about a woman who was caught in adultery. The religious leaders brought her to Jesus and the law stated, Jewish law, that she should be stoned to death. And all around in this particular story, everyone was picked up stones in readiness to stone her to death. And then Jesus said something to them. He said this, He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And of course what happened is all the stones fell to the ground. They fell to the ground because everyone was acutely aware that they were far from perfect. Now this is obviously in the context of how Jesus treats women. And very often in those days women were second class citizens. But Jesus sets an example to draw people back to their own sin and actually make no distinction between male and female. Jesus then turns to the woman and says, who is here to condemn you? And she basically turns around and says, no one. Jesus says, neither do I. It's clear that Jesus had an equal agenda when it came to the sexes in terms of how he treated them and how he felt they should be treated. And this story emphasises that really clearly. Here's a time for review. So what you're going to do with these, it's up to you. You can hold it, pause it, and actually try and write these answers down uh, in terms of when you see the questions, but they're based on the previous slide. So what you need to do is see if you can define sexism. Give two examples of how women in the past were treated unfairly. Explain how the story of Adam and Eve could be used to promote inequality. Use a quote from the Bible and explain how it could be used to promote equality. And also, the last one, explain how the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery could be used to promote equality. One of the key things when it comes to the Bible is obviously uh, certain texts to use. And uh, there's a quote that I use which basically says a text taken out of context becomes a pretext. Uh, and when you try and understand the text, especially in the Bible, it's important to understand your word bias, your own bias, but also the bias maybe within the text itself. If you simply want to find something in the Bible that supports your idea or opinion, no matter how irrational, you can. To gain a proper understanding of the Bible, there are a number of things you need to do, um, and this is to get the right context. And those five points there 
uh, you need to look at to actually get a proper context which makes sure that the text you're talking about or looking at is not going to be used in some way to uh, justify uh, bad or poor behavior. Obviously it comes from the Bible and uh, for example here's one about women uh, it was said by one of the writers in the New Testament, Paul, that women should not speak and I do not permit a woman to teach a man. She must be silent. Now, today, no one would say women can't speak in church or teach because many women do. However, some do use this to suggest that women cannot be in leadership of the church or can't teach in the church. So, some questions to think about. Uh, you'll need to have a look at those four questions and actually think about whether or not um, they are uh, correct and what other suggestions uh, you could find out in order to understand that text properly. Now in the Church of England recently uh, the first women bishop was welcomed into the church. Uh, they've allowed women priests for a long time now but this was the first time a woman had been um, ordained into being a bishop. Now the Roman Catholic Church on the other hand does not allow women to be priests and certainly wouldn't allow them to be bishops uh, and basically they interpret the texts differently uh, one key part of that would be they believe Jesus only had male disciples therefore only males can be priests now they would have a literal versus non-literal understanding of the text they're clearly interpreting the Bible differently one is being more liberal uh, and not saying the text means exactly this therefore you can't do this and the other is obviously being a bit li bit more liberal saying uh, possibly that time of Jesus was a very specific time in a specific place and we need to adjust our thinking and also our understanding of the sexes because we live in a different time and a different culture um, and therefore they come to a different conclusion and clearly they're, they're both sets of Christians but they understand the Bible differently therefore have different outcomes that's because um, they have interpreted the text differently as well again here are some things that we could ask ourselves um, that would be good for you to think about explain the phrase a text taken out of context becomes a pretext make sure you can understand that give a reason why the Roman Catholic Church only allows male priests explain how the story of Adam and Eve could be used to promote equality and give an example of how the Church of England Church has shown greater equality between men and women and five explain a Bible quote that suggests why women can't be leaders in the church now in the Bible itself there are lots of stories quotes that you could use. So I'm obviously going to pull some texts out that are very hopefully clear texts that would be used in favour of equality. Um, this text here talks about male and female being created by God which implies that they're both of the same value. Jesus often taught that you should love your neighbour as yourself. Your neighbour is anyone that is near you or next door to you um, or that you're working with. Your neighbour is simply anyone else. Uh, there's a quote from Paul that says here, there's no Jew or Greek, slave or free, they're all one in Christ, they're all the same, they're all equal. Um, Jesus talked about don't judge others, otherwise you will be judged, which kind of cuts out the idea of prejudice discrimination. For in the same way you judge, you will be judged yourself. So the measure you use when you're thinking and acting towards others is the measure uh, from a Christian perspective that God will judge you so that implies you shouldn't treat people in an inferior way the story of the Good Samaritan is a classic story that talks about treating people equally and especially those who maybe you consider less equal than yourself um, again the story we looked at earlier the idea of Jesus not condemning a woman um, uh, the one who was caught in the act of adultery and accepts her unconditionally and then there's a quote from the book of Revelation at the end of time where they're all standing before God and it says after this I look before me is a great multitude of people that no one can count from every nation tribe people and language so it's clear from this that the idea of heaven is a multicultural place racists will not like heaven because it has all people from all tribes all languages in its environment now often Jesus uh, talked very much about equality or the way he didn't outrightly talk about equality but certainly from the stories the idea of treating people 
in a uh, fair and equal way is very much part of it. And all of these quotes could be used to suggest that Christianity is in favour of equality, but you need to remember they all have specific contexts, but can be used to promote equality. Let's now look at racism. Racism has been one of the causes for um, inequality around the world and in our current culture this idea of um, immigrants or um, people who come over from other countries to work is uh, one that divides people as well. So we're going to have a look at this now. Racism basically means where you distinguish someone as inferior or superior to other race or races that are different from you. Now it's really important here, this has led to people being enslaved, given no rights, housing, poor housing, beaten and killed and no education. So it's a massive big deal. Some of the causes of racism may simply be that some people have a sense of superiority, they feel they're better than someone else. They might have been brought up in an environment that suggests that they are better than other people. Ignorance, that people just are ignorant to the fact that they are being racist and it's offensive. And obviously history plays a part in terms of the way certain people have been treated as well. None of these are acceptable, but they're all possible causes of how racism could have happened. Now in Britain today, let's have a look, because often people talk about the number of foreign people in the UK. So let's have a look at what we're dealing with here. Um, Britain tries to have a multicultural approach. So let's have a look at the percentages here of the people that are in the UK. Here they are. And you can see very, very clearly that over 90% of the people in the UK are white. If you're going to look at it on a uh, pie chart, it looks actually like this. So whenever you talk to people or you hear people on the radio uh, or you hear people on television, you get the impression that it was 50-50 or less than that. But clearly, uh, the predominant group of people are white British people and not lots of other races. Paddington, this idea that migration, migration is where people move from one place to another place um, to uh, for a variety of reasons. And here are some of the reasons why someone might leave their country and go to another country. They might fear death, there might be war, there might be a lack of freedom or jobs or political instability. And I'm sure if we often thought about these things, if this happened in our country, we'd want to escape and go somewhere that we felt was safer, not necessarily to steal its benefits, but to enable us to live a life. Martin Luther King again uh, was a Christian and uh, he was obviously the lead historical figure when it comes to this issue of racism. So what did he do? Well he basically took a non-violent approach and told his followers to do as Jesus did, to love their enemies and pray for them. He believed love and non-violence were powerful enough to defeat evil. He believed that Christian faith was about fairness, justice and equality for all people that God had created everyone equally. He was a preacher, he was a priest, he was a Christian minister, he read his Bible and he believed that in that Bible this is what this Bible told him, that everyone was equal. And his belief in God and fairness fueled his desire for justice for black people. Now today all mainstream Christians would be against racism. It's You'd find hardly any that would uh, be in any way in favour of racism and again for all the reasons we've said Jesus teaching people to love their neighbour the idea of God creating people equally Jesus teachings about how you need to treat people with compassion help those in need the story of the Good Samaritan and in fact most Christians believe they have a duty to end racism uh, wherever they are um, in any way that they can so Christians would be clearly against racism and, um, and they would use the Bible to back this up This is a quote from the book of Revelation that I've mentioned before that talks about all people from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before God and standing before Jesus at the end of their time. And this is talking about the fact that there will be all people from all cultures. Um, so as I said before, racists won't like heaven, it's far too multicultural. Well, let's have a little review again. Again, take some time to think about these questions where you can pause this if you want to think about if you can answer these questions. Can you give a definition of racism? Can you give an example of the effects of racism? Can you give one cause of racism and explain why? Can you give at least two Bible quotes that would oppose racism? Can you give one reason why people might r migrate to another country? Can you explain how Martin Luther King used his beliefs, Christian beliefs, to stand up against racism? 
And can you use a Bible quote that teaches Christians how to treat others equally? Again, these questions are good questions to get you thinking and maybe you need to go back uh, to actually uh, watch again a specific part in order to answer them. The next thing we're going to look at is Christian attitudes towards other religions. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this for some is a very exclusive way. It's called exclusivism. The way that only through Jesus can you get to God. Now, many Christians would actually have this approach. Uh, they would be exclusive in their ideas that only through Jesus can you get to God. Um, and therefore, all other religions are not necessarily totally wrong, but can never lead you truly to God because of what Jesus said. And these would be exclusivist Christians. Now, clearly, this can be seen as intolerant and discriminatory. Now, uh, the problem Christians have is this text in the Bible, and it's re associated with the very Jesus, uh, very Jesus's life and Jesus's words to others. The other group would be called inclusivists or inclusivism. And again, this is the idea that is more about religious pluralism, that all religions are equally valid and correct and can coexist. The idea that all roads ultimately lead to God and heaven. Um, so whether reg all religious experience comes from God, different cultures follow it in different ways, Hinduism in India um, and different religions around the world. Um, would it not be, they say, cruel for God to see the majority of the world uh, sent to hell and not go to heaven because they didn't believe in Jesus. So clearly there are those Christians that accept that people from different faiths get to God but just get there differently. This idea of God being love suggests that can God lead people out of heaven, leave people out of heaven because they don't believe in Jesus? What about if you grow up in a country where there is no teaching about Jesus? It's a different religion. Um, and ultimately as human beings if there is a God only God ultimately can answer that question or can judge those human beings in any way that is, is, is appropriate um, there's a phrase ecumenism and this phrase is basically the principle of promoting unity among the world's Christian churches. There are lots of Christian churches around the world, Catholics, Baptists, Methodists, Church of England, Pentecostals, that are all different denominations but all follow God and Jesus but maybe worship differently. So how do these particular groups actually work together? How can they work together? Well, they might support the working with the poor by helping out with the homeless. They might come together to help do that. They might support specific causes such as fighting against racism. They might pray together at special events. They might all get involved in politics to work for a fairer society. And these are all ways that the Christian church could actually get together to um, uh, get behind a particular cause and actually work together. That's what ecumenism actually means. What about this word evangelism then? Well, what does it mean? To evangelize basically means to go out and talk about your beliefs about God to other people. Now, someone who already believes something would have to convert, which means change someone's belief. Well, Christians believe it's their duty to share the good news of what God has done for them and that other people need to hear about it. So what might they do? Well, there's behind this evangelism, there's this belief that without God, people are going to hell. And with it behind this idea of evangelism is the peop the idea or belief that people are sinners. Evangelism primarily talks about is about talking to people about God, that God is real, that God wants to get be involved in your life. And obviously, as I said, it's that idea that people need God. Evangelism can be done in different ways. Just going to church, um, uh, going to an Alpha course, uh, there you start to learn about God. But it seems to be something that even Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. That is what evangelism means, sharing the good news. Well, again, let's review that. Can you give a definition of exclusivism? Could you explain why a Christian might be exclusivist in their beliefs? Can you give a de definition of inclusivism and explain why a Christian might hold this belief? What does ecumenism mean? Give one example of how churches might work together. And what does evangelism mean? Give one reason why a Christian might evangelize. Again, 
we're going to come on to something called reconciliation. Now this picture reflects the fact that these two people are not reconciled. And to be reconciled basically means to restore friendly relations between. So if you're not reconciled, you don't have those friendly relationships. Now Christians primarily think this word sin is something that separates and causes all the problems in the world. And sin primarily is this thing that separates us from God and each other. In order to be reconciled to God and each other, this sin needs to be forgiven or dealt with. Everyone sins, so forgiveness isn't something that Christians think happens once, but needs to be continual action. Not even when they become a Christian do they believe they don't sin. So forgiveness needs to be something that happens all the time, if you are going to keep that reconciliation with God in a good place, and also other people, not just Well. Jesus and forgiveness is really, really important to Christianity. He is quoted as saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. This idea of forgiveness primarily comes from this concept of Jesus dying for people's sins. One of the prayers that Jesus taught his disciples was, forgive those who sin against you. Christians believe that through this cross you can see Jesus is on, their sins are forgiven and that they're reconciled, connected back to God. So forgiveness is central to uh, their faith and Jesus also said in one of the prayers that he said that Christians should forgive others because they've been forgiven themselves. Now it's really important to understand that forgiveness is an essential part of being reconciled especially to God. It means that what has kept you apart no longer is able to do this. Christians believe they are able to be reconciled to God because of what Jesus did on the cross. I think a really key point here, it could be argued that the idea of forgiveness is the most crucial part of Christianity. Without forgiveness, you don't really have uh, Christian faith because the cross is where God is able to forgive people because of what Jesus did. Now, this word reconciliation, um, an example of this, or a practical example, is in South Africa and uh, Nelson Mandela and um, Desmond Tutu, Bishop Desmond Tutu said this uh, about Nelson Mandela that he inspired the country to walk the path of forgiveness and reconciliation after all the racism and the deaths in South Africa it could have turned really nasty with lots of deaths but actually there was a whole uh, truth and reconciliation committee set up in South Africa and it did not go up in flames and uh, because of people willing to forgive and reconcile uh, basically they put that down to that idea of forgiveness and reconciliation that people then started to work together rather than just become bitter and violent as a consequence and that was in large part down to uh, Nelson Mandela who wasn't necessarily a Christian uh, I don't think but certainly exhibited those qualities of forgiveness and reconciliation Roman Catholic Church confessions uh, is really important because uh, basically they go into a small box, tell the priest what they feel they need to confess and this act of confession doesn't ultimately because they're reconciled to God but obviously keeps that relationship with God, uh, that idea of confession that we all sin uh, connects that relationship back to God to a good place. So to Roman Catholics reconciliation and forgiveness and confession are all interlinked and are all really important to keep their relationship with God real. Again, let's review these. Can you now give a definition of reconciliation? Can you explain why forgiveness is important in Christianity? What is confession? Why might a believer forgive someone who wrongs them? What might be a practical effect of reconciliation? What does evangelism mean? I think we've already covered that one. What is sin and how does it affect people? Finally, there are some key words you need to be familiar with and you need to know the terms. And I'm just going to leave them there for you to look at. But you've got to make sure that each one of those terms and words you can describe and explain how they're used and what they're used and in what way they're used as well. This is the end of this revision video for Unit B604. Hopefully we've covered a lot of stuff. You might need to go back and uh, look over it. It's been a long uh, video but I hope it's useful in order for you to answer any questions you get on equality in Unit B604.